Welcome to Brainstorming America. I'm Ken Rollins here with John Merrill, and good to see you, John. Hey, Ken, great to be back. Yeah, good to have you back in, Amer in America, now in Alabama again. Been seeing you all up in uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Yes, sir. Of and I was places. in San Juan, Puerto Rico the week before that. Really? Yes, sir. Man, you need to put your anchor out somewhere. But no, I, I just, uh, I watched uh, my favorite uh, former Secretary of State up there representing Alabama at the convention in uh, Milwaukee. Yes, sir. And I envied you. Matter of fact, I got a little bit jealous. Uh, getting to see all the things you saw. I, I saw, I saw a lot of conventions in my time way back in the, the George Wallace, all those others back. But that was one of the finest conventions I've seen in a long time. It was nothing uh, upsetting about it. The only thing that was upsetting was that old Secret Service uh, director popping in unannounced, uh, that kind of thing, and a bunch of senators chasing her all over. But other than that, it was a awesome well, convention. as I had a number of people ask me, and of course Cindy and I were both delegates there at the convention in Milwaukee last week, uh, it was clear to me that, comparatively speaking, to the first time that we started seeing televised conventions back in 1952, when Dwight Eisenhower was running for his first term, uh, this convention had more energy, more enthusiasm, uh, more vigor, more excitement than any convention that I have witnessed in person or on television, with a possible exception of Ronald Reagan's re-election convention in 1984. Right. And at that point, everyone knew that his re-election was a foregone conclusion, and people wanted to be a part of it. They were excited about it. Uh, Reagan just naturally generated energy, enthusiasm, and excitement from people, but especially when he was in your presence. And that's the only one that I think positively compares to this one that we just saw in Milwaukee last week. You left off one word, emotion. Yes, sir. A lot of that. And I see it at home on TV. You had to see it better there. But I bet you got a favorite part. But I, I have one, I have several favorite parts, but that one of them was that granddaughter telling her story why she asked her daddy to let her speak. That's right. And she talked about a different Donald Trump that we talked about. That's everybody. right. And I was, I was one of them, I was glad I was home. Somebody was peeling onions in my, my onion in my room till I scared my little dog. He didn't know what was wrong with daddy because I was, uh, whether it's Democrat, Republican, to have a grandchild that spoke so eloquent and from the heart, she wrote her speech. And so she, uh, she moved me to think of Donald Trump in those moments and to see that little granddaughter sitting on his knee, to see a different Donald Trump than all of us get to see. Well, she talked about him from the same perspective that we all talk about our loved ones, Absolutely. whether it be our grandfather and grandmother, our mother and dad. And she talked about what he meant to her as a grandfather and how he had influenced her and how he called her at school and how he encouraged her as she participated in the golf activity there at school and as a part of their golf team. She talked about how he was uh, so proud of what she had done with her work in school, her academic work, and how he bragged to his friends about her making the high honor roll and how that impressed him and how it made her feel because he showed that pride. And that's what all of our grandparents have done about us and about our relationship with them. And he's no different than we are. And a lot of times it's difficult for people to accept that because he's Donald Trump. Well, he's Donald Trump who is a man who loves his family and that was revealed more this time in this convention than in any other environment that we've ever seen him. She, know, she, uh, she was really good when it would come to the part about did she ever beat him right. playing golf. And they played just about every day according to her. Uh, she, he'd call her and say, you want to play golf? And so she, yes, she's always ready to play golf. But, she, but the best part of that, Ken, was when 
she said, when we're not on the same team, and he tries to rattle me. Yeah, get by, in my head. Talk to me about how I'm going to play or how I'm going to mm-hmm. perform and to uh, discourage me from doing well. <laughs> and he's always disappointed and surprised when it doesn't work. Yeah. <laughs> but she said, but he forgets, I'm a Trump too. That was <laughs> the that. best part. I remember that part. That was so great. Yeah, it, that was the, the, the one I said about emotion because – they was uh, there was a lot in that uh, thing, but there there was a message from uh, his wife that's played about the shooting that really painted another picture of Donald Trump, and she talked about who he was as a man who loved this country, and everything you hear about him is uh, he built the skyline from New York. And even in those trials, I want everybody out there, out of them 34 and all that stuff, all this stuff, he never, ever took money without paying it back. He never, from the banks, all the banks was ready to loan him money at any time right now because he always paid back what he won. Now, if any of you folks out there watching us ever got an appraisal on your home and it was worth 200,000 and you got it appraised for 250 so you can get some more money on your loan. Do you feel like you should have went to jail for that? If somebody's willing to give you 250 when it's valued at 200? That's what they were doing, but but did you lose any money? That's entrepreneurship and that's the American way. Thank you. And speaking of the American way, we're excited that you've chosen to join us for the 65th episode of Brainstorm in America. We're gonna take a short break and we'll be right back. Welcome back to Brainstorm in America. Ken Rollins here with John Merrill. And John, when we went to a commercial, we were talking about a lot of stuff, but uh, we're talking about the convention mainly, but yes, I want to do another subject for Ken. And recently, in the next past day or so, uh, the president um, gave up his uh, office. Biden gave up his office to Kamala Harris. He's, well, he's actually resigned said the convention. That, that he's going to forego securing the nomination for re-election and endorsed Vice President Harris to be the nominee for the Democratic Party. But at this point, at the time of the recording of this show, uh, he still is the chief executive and the president of the United States and has indicated that he has no interest in giving up that position, but intends to serve through January the 20th, 2025. Correct. That's exactly what I said. No. I left off that part, but he he is really they coronated her. I'll call it that. They've coronated her. I think that'd I, be accurate. And I think I don't know, but I don't think that's by any bylaws. Anybody would have a, have a. They may have the Democrats may have that in their bylaws, but I can't believe that is the way that that's written. Well, they certainly can give anyone the nomination that they choose to give it to whether that person is in office, whether they're out of office, whether they're a declared candidate or an undeclared candidate. The party can make their own rules and do what they want to do. And of course, Vice President Harris has been on the phone contacting delegates and asking them to endorse her candidacy so she can serve as the Democratic nominee in the fall of 2024. As the Republican National Convention ended last week, we've got two weeks before the Democrat National Convention starts, which is right after the Olympic Games conclude. Well, I'll just put it this way, from a country boy, this plain old downright, there has not one person in the United States voted for Kamala Harris for President of the United States. She was on a ticket with Joe Biden as his running mate, but not for the president. That's correct. So she has been handed basically the presidency by de facto uh, transactions that they've done, but nobody voted for her to get over there. And those ballots, those uh, delegates that she got handed to her, if I was one of those delegates, 
I would be a little bit upset having my vote go to somebody that I didn't vote for. Now, sure, she was on that party, Biden, Harris, Harris, Biden. Right. But to see democracy, they always crying about democracy. Sure, and of course, she would have to be nominated again and secure the vice presidential nomination if President Biden was actually selected as the Democratic nominee to proceed toward the November 5th general election, and that didn't occur. So nobody voted for her as the Democratic nominee for president, and nobody voted for her as the Democratic vice presidential nominee for 2024. I was expecting to hear, Madam Chairman, the great state of Arizona casts two votes for Kamala Harris and 36 votes for Mark whatever. That's what I expected to right. hear on a real convention. Sure. Where people have their representatives make the selection. They say, okay, you go to you go to the convention in Chicago and you we the city we these people here, we vote for Joe Biden or we vote for Joe Schmo. And that's who they're supposed to represent. Those delegates like you that went to uh, Milwaukee, you were supposed to vote for uh, Yes, I was Biden. pledged to vote for President Trump. So there you go. Now, if you had went up there and uh, and somebody told you, uh, John, you're, you said you was going to support Trump, but we want to take your, we're going to take your uh, representation away from you and give it to uh, Billy Bob. That that's where I'm saying the, 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 I'm getting about the hypocrisy of the left. I always talk about democracy. Sure. Well, this is the most undemocratic. <laughs> thing I have ever seen. Well, there's no doubt about it because it is a strict coronation and it is one that a number of people have been concerned about because of the very things that Ken has introduced and also the fact that uh, no one has ever voted for Kamala Harris to be the presidential nominee for the Democratic Party. Even when she was a candidate back in 2019 and 2020 when she was running for the nomination because she dropped out before the Iowa caucus ever occurred, which is the first time that people can actually cast a ballot for you. I was watching a, uh, some people from California talking last night, and they wanted one of the guys that I believe he's assistant district attorney or something, they don't find anything in the records where she's prosecuted anybody. She talks about being a prosecutor, but she never prosecuted anybody. That she had opportunities to prosecute uh, child molesters, all kind, but she didn't do it. And that's, uh, I think that's really going to come out and really hit her in the face because I wouldn't go out there and brag about being a prosecutor if I never prosecuted anyone. Well, she wouldn't brag about being a prosecutor in 2019 and 2020 when she was running for the presidency, which is one of the reasons that she appeared soft on crime and one of the things that hurt her in trying to secure the nomination. Yeah, she is a anti-police, she's anti-everything. And if you remember, during the, when the, the thing happened in Minnesota with Floyd, she, the, the riots, the burning of the buildings and everything, a lot of people went to jail, a few people went to jail. She set up a, a pack type range to, her, to raise money to bail those people out. She was one of the people that was as fast as they go in, just like a turnstile. Is going into jail, coming right out, because they knew when they burnt that building that they ain't going to be in there just a couple hours. That's correct. And one of the things that we want to make sure that you do is you get out of jail in time to watch the last segment of the 65th episode of Brainstorm in America. We'll see you right back here for our final segment. Welcome to Brainstorm in America. I'm Ken Rollins, and we're here with John Merrill. And John, uh, let's go to another subject on as we go forward with the show today one of the uh, next show uh, a segment i want to uh i got a note here to it says watch out for kamala now i wrote that note before the, all this change because this changed within a few hours yes, as a sir. matter of fact at 9 45 that morning a representative of joe biden come on tv and said on fox news and said they need to leave the president alone. 
He has said that he's going forward. He intends to win. 945, I saw that. At 11, <laughs> he resigned. <laughs> now, you got to wonder. Well, again, he withdrew from being a candidate well, yeah. to secure the nomination. But what would you think? Who did it? Was it Pelosi or Schumer or both of them? Well, I think the bottom line is this. When President Obama, when Senator Schumer, who's the majority leader, and when former Speaker Pelosi made their desires known to have Vice President Kamala Harris become the Democratic nominee, then the president had absolutely no choice. He was going to have to withdraw. He was not going to be able to pursue the nomination. He didn't have their support, which is one of the reasons why he was able to become the nominee in 2020. And Jim Clyburn, who is the one that is responsible for President Biden being president today because of what he did in 2020 in South Carolina, when he came out for Vice President Harris immediately after the president indicated he would not be a candidate, it was game on. I, uh, I'm on record with a lot of people as saying that uh, Joe Biden would never resign and the reason for he'd start his next uh, four years, but he may turn it over to Kamala at that point. But he would still be the president because he could he could uh, pardon his son who's coming and going to trial here in a few more days. He could actually pardon his son. Well, staying in there the six months as he's going to, he may get a chance to. Uh, if I understand pardoning, uh, you can actually pardon somebody for a crime that has not been committed yet, for crimes that might be, committed. or that they've not been charged with. Right. So he's going to have. And that's what happened with President Nixon when President Ford pardoned him in August of 2000. Uh, I'm sorry, August of 1974. Well, Ford went ahead and uh, did pardon it for the better of the United States That's right. to calm everything down. But I just look at this situation because Hunter has been everything to Joe. And they got too many things in the fire. This, when asked uh, yesterday about the uh, the uh, charges against uh, President Biden for the money laundering and all the things that took place under his uh, leadership with uh, with Hunter and his brother and a lot of the other Bidens and other friends that they've done a lot of money with uh, our enemies, a lot of our enemies they dealt they dealt with and uh, big money and so they asked the question, what does this do with uh, Biden now that he's uh, going to let his time run out and the word from uh, from the chairman was uh, they're going to go on with the charges because this was a charges against the United States where they were taking money under the table illegally. And so I don't know what's, what's going to happen on all that. But I do know that Hunter Biden, Kamala, if she were to she'd say, if I get president, I will pardon your son. That's got to happen. That's got to be part of it because he's not going to leave his son waving in the wind out there with no, you know, going to jail. That's Without it. question. Absolutely. Well, that was, uh, now they've, uh, the Democrats, I've been listening, I've watched it religiously. The Democrats have one goal for the United States, get Trump. I mean, everything you see, they can't breathe without the word Trump coming out of their mouth. Trump is not their worry. The, the grocery bill is, should be their worry. The gas bill, all the things that they've done to harm this country should be their worries because the only way, in my opinion, they're gonna get the votes they need is take care of some uh, grocery bills, take care of some rent, take care of some automobile costs. You know, I say everything I've seen has gone up. Uh, Automobile purchases, new new ones, 16% up. Uh, now we're looking at used car purchases, uh, like 9% up. And then your, your mortgages is 22% up. 
And John, you can't build a house now. No, sir. Your body lumber lately? Unbelievable I have. the cost. I have. And I was going to build my daughter a deck. I got the uh, people at Lowe's to print out. This guy was a deck builder. He printed out X number two by fours, X number two by sixes, exactly what it takes to build a 16 by 16 deck, including the screws. He printed it out, gave me that printout, signed it with his name and his cell number to call him when I got it. So I go back there a month later, a little over a month maybe, to, and hand the uh, guy this ticket he gave me. They loaded it by the ticket. That was sixteen hundred dollars when I owned the ticket. Thirty seven hundred dollars. Oh. Hey, thirty seven hundred on some wood and I had I loaded it on my trailer and what am I gonna do? I mean, I went ahead and paid over double. And you would have been able to have not only purchased the raw materials, but you'd been able to build the deck for that amount total. Absolutely. If you had known that's what was going to happen, you'd have done it earlier. But now here's what I was getting at is that's costing me because it's lumber. What about if you're building a house, your contractor, and you're building a house and you say you're going to build me a house for $150,000. Now, you're basing that on lumber being X number of dollars a foot. Now that has tripled in cost. Not double, but triple in cost. That $150,000 home you is going to have to be $220,000 plus the labor, extra labor. And, uh, I don't know. It's just how can anybody buy their first? You got new couples every day. There's somebody going out getting married and we're going to start our new home. We're going to get us a new home. I tell you, Ken, it's hard times, and it's hard times for a lot of families. As a matter of fact, Ken and I would like to dedicate the 65th episode of Brainstorm in America to our friend Jeff Sparks today. He's our producer, and he's our floor manager. He's not with us today because his brother Steve is having a hard time. He's been diagnosed with leukemia, so please keep him in your prayers. We hope you'll join us again next week for our next episode of Brainstorm in America.